threshold of a great event, both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind. This universal declaration of human rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. On the 10th of December, 1948, the 58 member countries of the United Nations agreed to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, drafted by the United Nations. This was a milestone moment in the history of the world. This document set out for the first time the fundamental human rights that are to be universally protected. Article 1 starts with the words, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and human rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights sets out a vision of a world of freedom and dignity for every person. There never was, nor has there been since, a global agreement as positive and far-reaching as this. Since then, it's been criticised for falling far short of its ideals because of the corruption and hypocrisy of some of the governments of this world. Yet it has still inspired and paved the way for more than 70 human rights treaties at both global and regional levels. It has still protected countless millions of people around the world and exposed crimes and abuses against the vulnerable internationally. What most people don't know is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was based on Christian principles. That's because the chief architect of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was a deeply committed Christian. Not only that, but she was a woman who, in a man's world, wielded influence and power with grace and dignity on the international stage. Her name, Eleanor Roosevelt. Join me as we follow her story and see how she illustrates some of the most important teachings of Jesus. On a hillside by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus gave us the Beatitudes. The center of Jesus' teachings about the Kingdom of God is the Sermon on the Mount. And the very heart of the Sermon on the Mount are the Beatitudes. So if we really want to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to live as a citizen of the Kingdom of God, then we must understand Christ's teaching in the Beatitudes. But the Beatitudes aren't just spiritual principles for Christians. They are arguably the body of principles that has been most influential in shaping Western civilization as we know it today. The word Beatitude might sound like it's an old fashioned religious sounding word and one that not many people will recognize today. But it refers to being blissfully happy. When Jesus calls people blessed in the Beatitudes, that's literally what He means. He means that if you display these qualities, you will be blissfully happy. This is a happiness that belongs only to God and that can come only from God. And among the Beatitudes, He said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a strange way for Jesus to start the Beatitudes in this first part of the Sermon on the Mount. Most people associate happiness with being rich, but instead Jesus says that it is the poor in spirit who are blessed. Many Americans look to the First Ladies, the wives of Presidents, as icons of style and grace. Eleanor Roosevelt was the First Lady from 1933 to 1945, 
and she was so much more. Eleanor's childhood was traumatic. She dramatically survived a disaster at sea when a ship she was traveling on sunk out in the ocean. She lost both her parents as a child. Her mother and younger brother died from diphtheria in 1892. Her father, who was an alcoholic, died two years later after jumping from a window while delirious. Before his death, her father asked young Eleanor to care for her remaining younger brother, Paul, who sadly also followed his father's drinking habits. All of these things meant that Eleanor grew up amid loneliness and loss and starved of love. That's why she was left prone to depression for the rest of her life. And it didn't help that Eleanor was raised by a rather severe grandmother. Although Eleanor abandoned the religion of her grandmother, she kept her habits of regular prayer and church attendance. She also retained from her upbringing a stern sense of duty. The reality was that despite the tragedies she experienced, Eleanor knew that she had been born into a very privileged family. Eleanor's own personal losses gave her a deep sense of empathy for the suffering of others. Her sense that much is expected of those to whom much is given, as Jesus had taught, made her passionately committed to helping the disadvantaged. From her youth, Eleanor developed a deep knowledge of Scripture. In fact, she memorized large parts of the New Testament. Eleanor's faith was grounded in two key passages. One of them was the question asked by the Hebrew prophet Micah in chapter 6 and verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The other key passage on which she based her life was the words of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40, where Jesus says, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. It was this humble walk with God that was to characterize Eleanor's life. It came naturally to her to recognize in any circumstance who the least of these were, those who needed to receive mercy and justice in their lives. Eleanor also especially loved the Sermon on the Mount, and in particular the Beatitudes. She internalized them so that they naturally became the guiding principles of her life. All her life, Eleanor Roosevelt used to carry a quote in her purse which said to think seldom of your enemies, often of your friends, and every day of Christ. Her aim was to live out the teachings of Jesus as fully as possible. On the 17th of March, 1905, Eleanor married Franklin D. Roosevelt, who entered politics and became the 32nd and longest serving president of the United States of America. He's the only American president to serve more than two terms. Even in public life, Eleanor never missed church and was the spiritual rock of her family. She insisted on taking her children to church even though their father didn't go. Eleanor had a compassionate empathy for all who were disadvantaged. Despite being First Lady, she would often be seen privately distributing food and gifts in the alleys of the slums of Washington. Although Eleanor was a deeply devout Christian, people remember her for what she did for others rather than for her religion. And that's how it should be. She lived what she believed. She always said that it was not a question of what one believed, but how one lived out one's beliefs. But it was indeed her public achievements that distinguished her. Eleanor lived in a time when it was unusual for women to be prominent in public life. This, combined with her own humility, meant that she was self-effacing about her own achievements. However, Eleanor developed her own gentle but powerful leadership style, and she was highly respected for her diplomacy and advocacy 
both in the United States and across the international community. Long before Martin Luther King Jr., Eleanor Roosevelt was a leader for civil rights on behalf of whomever were oppressed, whether African Americans or Jews or women. The issues of immigrants and refugees today aren't new to the United States. On these issues, Eleanor took as her reference point the story of Jesus, how he was born to poor parents, how he himself became an immigrant in peril for his life. Not only did Eleanor go through the Great Depression and the First World War, but her husband, Franklin, contracted polio in the prime of his life. Yet Eleanor stood alongside Franklin, and together they helped to guide America through the dark days of World War II. Through all of this, Eleanor lived a life of happiness and purpose for the sake of others. But we still haven't mentioned what was perhaps Eleanor Roosevelt's greatest achievement, which was that she led the drafting of the Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations, which has brought incalculable good for those who suffer in this world. As you might imagine, just after the Second World War, the launch of the United Nations was a difficult and complicated process. There were simmering tensions between the Americans, the Russians and the Chinese. So it was only natural President Harry S. Truman chose the greatest diplomatic heavyweights he could find. He also chose Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. When Eleanor received the news, she was dumbfounded. She initially reacted by saying that she had other things to do and knew nothing at all about international law anyway. However, her secretary, Malvina Thompson, said to her, Mrs. Roosevelt, I believe I would be hesitant to say no to the President of the United States. Fortunately, Eleanor said yes to the appointment, and in January 1946, she sailed to London. Of course, the US diplomatic delegation comprised of government officials, and they weren't exactly thrilled to have a woman as part of their team. So they decided to get her out of the way by putting her on a committee that would be insignificant and basically irrelevant. That's why they put Eleanor on the Human Rights Committee, which was expected to achieve nothing. But how wrong they were. At the first meeting of the committee, despite strenuous Russian objections, Eleanor was appointed chair and set a goal of drafting a universal declaration of human rights. In a time when women weren't often leaders, Eleanor had developed a very understated yet effective leadership style. She would sit back and let everyone have their say, and then she would steer the discussion toward her desired outcome. Eleanor recalled one conversation during the drafting of the Charter of Human Rights, of which she wrote that the conversation became so philosophical and so lofty that as she told it, she couldn't even follow along. She later said, I simply filled the teacups again and sat back to be entertained by the talk of these learned gentlemen. But no one there would have taken this modest account at face value. They were already familiar with Eleanor's style of chairmanship and they had the greatest respect for her leadership. She knew what she wanted and she made sure she got it. She was absolutely no pushover. But Eleanor's own accounts of these meetings hugely understated her own fundamental contribution. She downplayed her own achievements. That was just her modest way. It has taken more recent historians to recognize that she was indeed the driving force of the whole project. Her role was critical in creating what had been deemed impossible, the creation of a UN Charter of Human Rights. There are few American women who have been so universally admired as Eleanor Roosevelt. There are few who have left behind such an illustrious record 
of service to others. When she died in 1962, she was described by the New York Times as more involved in the minds and hearts and aspirations of people than any other first lady in history and as one of the most esteemed women in the world. At a funeral, President Truman honoured Eleanor Roosevelt by calling her the First Lady of the World. When Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, he wasn't talking about financial poverty. There have been some Christians throughout the centuries who have thought that Jesus was encouraging his followers to be poor. Now, it's true that the word poor in the original languages means to be utterly destitute. Being materially poor, starving and living with endemic diseases in slums is a very difficult situation. In fact, the Christian message calls us to help people out of these situations. But Jesus was talking about poverty in a different sense. Neither was Jesus saying that those who think poorly of themselves are blessed. Because thinking that you are of no value, no worth, cripples you in every aspect of your life. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes on to talk about how infinitely valuable every person is to God. So what did Jesus mean when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit? Well, to understand this, we must look at its opposite. In the Bible, poverty of spirit is contrasted with being haughty in spirit. A good passage to look at is Proverbs chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, which says, pride goes before destruction a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Now, notice here that those with a haughty spirit take from others and exploit them. Also notice a very important thing about those who are lowly in spirit, which is the same as being poor in spirit. Instead of oppressing others, they sit with the oppressed. They have the spirit of empathy and compassion for others, particularly for those who are downtrodden and who suffer. This is the key to understanding what it means to be poor in spirit. Those with a haughty spirit are so full of their own self-importance that they have no time for God. And as a result, they will also have no time for others they will knowingly or unknowingly hurt others and oppress them. The poor in spirit refers to those who recognize that without God, they are helpless. And so they put their full trust in God alone. The result of this kind of inner humility before God will be manifested in a life of external care and concern for others and for their suffering to look for ways to right what is wrong in the world around us. There is a very good reason why this is the first of the Beatitudes. It's because poverty of spirit is the foundation of everything else in the kingdom of God. Without poverty of spirit, you'll never experience the blessedness of the other Beatitudes in your life. None of the other blessings in the Beatitudes can be achieved in your own strength. We have to be reliant on God. That's what poverty of spirit means. Poverty of spirit is the foundation of everything because God must be first. When you are truly poor in spirit, things, material possessions, will mean nothing to you and God will mean everything. The spiritual, takes precedent over the material in our lives. The difference between those with a haughty spirit and those who are poor in spirit is powerfully illustrated by Jesus' parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector that he told in Luke chapter 18. Let's read it together. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, 
one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In this parable, Jesus is talking about a person's view of their own spiritual assets. He isn't talking about money, but about the heart. The Pharisee considered himself spiritually superior, and so he stood apart from the others and focused on the good things that he did. However, the tax collector, whom everybody despised, acknowledged his spiritual bankruptcy before God. And he was the one, said Jesus, who went home justified before God, and not the Pharisee. The Pharisee puts himself first. However, the tax collector puts God first. Jesus says that the tax collector went home justified. In this way, the promise of the Beatitude is fulfilled, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we are poor in spirit, so that we have space in our hearts for God. Only those who are poor in spirit can have the heart of Jesus. And when you have the heart of Jesus, His priorities become your priorities. Self will mean less, and others will mean more to us. Jesus came to live among us, to seek and to save the lost. When you are poor in spirit, you will naturally identify with the downtrodden, the abused, and the suffering in the world. You will want circumstances or the situation on this earth to be as it is in the kingdom of heaven. That's why you'll be able to wholeheartedly pray to God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But you won't only pray it, you will dedicate your life to the cause of the kingdom. That's what Eleanor Roosevelt did, and that's why she changed our world for the good. This is the first of the Beatitudes, and it's possibly the most challenging because it confronts us in the most radical way possible. All of us are naturally so full of our own self-importance that we have little or no space in our lives for God. And because of that, we have little or no space in our lives for the suffering of others and therefore for righting the wrongs in our society. If you want to do a quick check on how you stand with regards to this, then simply ask yourself, how am I spending the hours that God has given me every day? That'll probably give you a rough idea of where your priorities are right now. You see, if you have a humble attitude before God, you will have a humble heart before others. You will always, always have a compassionate, merciful and empathetic heart towards those who are oppressed, downtrodden, abused and suffering in this world. This Beatitude is challenging. None of the blessings of the other Beatitudes which follow will be ours if we don't possess poverty of spirit. It's a tragedy that, for so many, the pursuit of material consumes them and crowds out the pursuit of the spiritual. Just a little later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was talking about our material needs when he said, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Nothing captures the imagination quite like a story. And this is true of the enthralling stories Jesus told in the Gospels, known as parables. 
If you would like to find out more about these parables and understand their deeper meaning, if you would like to find out the reason Jesus used parables and how they can apply to our lives, then I'd like to recommend the amazing free gift we have for all our Incredible Journey viewers today. It's the devotional book, Christ's Object Lessons. This classic book explains the teachings of Jesus like you've not seen or read before. It explores the depths of the best loved teachings of Jesus in the parables by explaining the story itself and then sharing its spiritual significance. This book will inspire and encourage you as you find meaning and purpose in your life. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. I guarantee there are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the free offer we have for you today. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand. Or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed our journey with Eleanor Roosevelt and the Declaration of Human Rights and our reflections on the meaning of the first beatitude, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, let's pray and ask God to guide us and help us get our priorities right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are created equal in your eyes, that you love each one of us. Help us to see the world around us with eyes of dignity, compassion and mercy. And Father, may we always remember to make you first and foremost in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen.